I want to attempt this morning to <clears throat> enter into the agony and the conflict, if I may, between Jesus Christ <clears throat> and the folks who did him to death on religious principles. I'm asking you to turn, if you like, those of you like to follow the Scripture, the eighth chapter of the Gospel of John. There is nowhere in the Gospel of John to begin reading. If you start at verse 12, you wish you'd start at verse 11. It is a tremendous book, as I understand it, in the 20th chapter of John. <coughs> The Holy Spirit directed a man in the name of John to say something like this. Now the Lord did a lot of other things, said a lot of other things, but said, I haven't recorded them in this book too many, but he said, what's in this little book called the Gospel of John? These things are written that you might believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and believing might have L-I-F-E life in his name. One thinks of Pilgrim in Pilgrim's Progress, who puts his fingers in his ears and runs away from his companions screaming as he runs, Life, give me life. And he felt that he had to stop up his ears so he couldn't hear the rumblings of the spirit of his day and run to him who gives life. If men and women can be brought to a lifelong believing that he's the Son of God. Here in the eighth chapter, the controversy between this one, Jesus, and the leaders of the most religious nation on earth is rapidly coming to a head. We just have a few more verses to read till we get to the 11th chapter. You're familiar, those of you who study your Bibles, with the fact that it was the raising of Lazarus from the dead that sealed the death of Jesus Christ, the high priest of their religion, Unable to deny this, said it is convenient that one man die for a nation. And that just brings up to focus the controversy of my Lord when he was here in the days of his flesh with the religious leaders of his day. It is a solemn thought to remember that the people who did the Lord Jesus to death were the most devout religious people of his day. If you read the Gospel of John, you can almost hear the groans of the people who finally found out what the score was, and the score was this. We've got to get rid of this man. We've just got to. We've got to get the whole nation going down the drain if we don't set the high priest. And they did, leaving God out. They nailed him to a tree. They thought they had accomplished the one thing that had to be done to enable them to continue in their religious forms and doctrines and creeds, and at the same time 
live by devouring the widows. In the first part of this eighth chapter, when these religious people bring the woman taken in adultery, all the Lord got to do to get rid of them is to point to the fact that a bunch of adulterers are pointing the finger in an adulteress. They skedaddle. When he said, which of you is without sin, he wasn't talking about going to the movies. He's talking about the same sin. They wanted him to condemn this poor woman for him. I believe with all my heart and with so or not that the cycle has come full circle now. I believe it's your privilege or your misfortune to live in a generation exactly like the one that with wicked hands nailed Jesus Christ to the cross. And they didn't do it and just as an act of thought. They did it out of starkness. Necessity. It's Jesus or us. Somebody's got to die. If we don't get rid of him, we will. And that's the issue of this hour. When it comes to a focus here, I'm going to believe, I believe I'll read verse 20. These words of John the 8th chapter, these words spake Jesus in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no man laid hands on him yet they wanted to. Seventh chapter John, they already got signs all over the country, so much money for information leading to the apprehension of one Jesus of Nazareth. But they don't lay hands on him yet. Well, there's somebody else on the scene, Almighty God, for his hour was not yet come. And then said Jesus again unto them, he'd said it before, he said, I go my way, and ye shall seek me, and shall die in your sins, and whither I go, Ye are not able to come. Then said these Jews, the leaders of the Jews, when what he's talking about, will he kill himself? Because he saith, whither I go, ye are not able to come. And so he pressed it a little closer, and he said unto them, Don't run out of the building now. Ye are from beneath. Isn't that a compliment? I tell you, the Lord was a diplomat if ever was one. This is a good way to win friends and influence people. Remember in the book of John, there are two classes of unsaved people all through that chapter. They are children of wrath. They are not God's children yet. But the door hadn't been closed on. But these folks that the Lord's talking about, not children of wrath, brother, they're sons of hell. Their character's crystallized. The die has been cast. My Lord will say in this chapter, Ye are of your father the devil. Ye are of your father the devil. When I say that the circle turned full cycle, I know it's so or not, I just, I think I've got a good deal of evidence for it is. I'm going to plead with men and women this morning, face the fact, pretty certain you're going to go to hell, brother. You're living in a day. You're living in a day. Not of child's play, but of bitter hostility to God's Son. 
You're living in a day when in the name of Christianity, Jesus Christ is being crucified afresh. And you're living in a day when there's a spirit back of all of the manifestations and crack-ups everywhere. That spirit is diabolical and satanically inspired. And under God, there's a war going on now to get rid utterly of Jesus Christ. And I think with your little man that can be experienced that most any kind of preacher could shake with a little lollipop. I think in this day of the pampering of the flesh until our religious flesh S T I N K stinks in the nostrils of the Holy Ghost. I think chances are most of us have been crystallized in our character. Sonship has to do with character maturity. Sons of hell, ye are from beneath. Brother, the crack up of everything that's high and holy in church and home and nation, in politics and economic, in the economical world and the social world. If a man is living on the moon now and we establish contact and they pay us a visit and he come and go over to the place where I'm being entertained at an intersection in the Globe stores and the First National Bank of Pasadena and the highways and the stores and take a look, he think he is living in an absolute jungle. And the dare to tell him that there was a grain of Christianity in America, he'd laugh at us. You're from the knees. And then no piety in Jesus Christ, I'm from above. I'm from above these crazy liberals on that doctrine of evolution that are turning our schools into incubators for eternal hell. There to see my Lord never claim to be God. He does, yeah. I'm from above. The year that this cosmos, your breath, is saturated with the God-hating, Christ-denying, Holy Spirit-despising spirit and atmosphere of this age. And I'm not of this world. He says, I'm just going to put cards on the table to you now. Here it is. I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if you believe, and the word if here, I'm pretty certain means sense, because these folks he's talking to, but they've already cast their vote. Since ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins in our churches, in our homes, in our society. It looks like this generation is made up in mind. Whoever Jesus Christ is, he's dead sure not going to be my Lord and my Savior. I'm going to stick to my little nambit pamby stuff they call an experience that knows nothing of the crucifixion of the sinner on that cross of shame 
and the resurrection into an entirely new way of living. And the respect to the spirit of this age that crucified the Son of God one time over just one issue. It is amazing that they killed him because of their perverted view of the doctrine of election. I felt them the other day that this church gone seed on election. I think it has. And I asked the pastor how many times he preached on his life, and he said twice, struck out both times. But I think we just about all of us gone seed on it when we look at this awful truth. That the reason those people with wicked hands, in spite of warning, in spite of plain talk, in spite of being faced with the alternative that we read here in the scripture, the reason they did him unto death and made fun of him in his agony and congratulated themselves on their wonderful achievement is because they wanted to be claim, to claim that they were children of Abraham and live without holiness and godliness and surrender. That's why they killed him. Why they'll say to the Lord, what's he talking about? You could do something for us. When he said, if the Son shall make you free, they said, why, what in the name of heaven are you talking about? You mean to tell me we need anything? No, sir, we be children of Abraham. If you read the book of John, that was the issue. Either this Jesus has got to go, or we're going to have to prove that we're children of Abraham. But two things that we ain't got. My Lord said if you were children of Abraham, you'd have his faith. And my Lord said, if you were children of Abraham, you'd have his what? His works. They both died out sometime while we've been asleep in our generation. And in order to continue to have a religion that would leave men in control of the reins of their own lives, the religious leaders of that generation did not stop until they saw that Jesus stretched out on a gory tree and carefully watched as his body was placed six feet under the ground and went home to a state dinner. Thanking God they got rid of him. This is about how serious it is now. We're going to have to quit sitting on the fence. The issue my Lord made was this. I am he. I am he. And unless men and women can come to the place in the Bible meaning of the word that they believe that he is the set one of God, the Son of God, and God the Son, the only remedy. They're going to die in their sins too. My Lord says three terrible things here. He said you're going to die in your sins. That's physical death. He says, second thing, you're not going where I'm going. That's the second death. In language that all of us youngsters and all can understand, he said, you're going to die in such a fashion physically that we are going to be forever separated from what's ever out yonder. You're from the knee. Like Judas, you're going to your own place. I'm from above. I'm going to the bosom of the Father, and you're not going to be able to make it. My soul. How 
strict this is, ye are not able to enter. And he calls their attention to the only way of escape. I wish I knew how to meditate with you in this awful day. I wish I'd come down and sit down beside you and stick a knife in your spirit and your soul and your heart and get you in this fat day of a Christianity that's putting Christ to an open shame and crucifying him afresh. I wish you'd just face what an awful price man has to pay if he dies in his sin. I wish that I knew how to proclaim it till somebody would believe it, that there's some things God hates a whole lot worse than he does death. I know none of us can believe it, I guess, in this soft age in which we live. And I wish we had somebody that actually had a conviction before I'll succumb, before I'll go the way of this age, before I'll let down the standards, before I'll say, Comrade, before I'll join the movement, I'll die. Because there are some things that are worse than death. In the catalog of God's book of remembrance, as I am said, is more intolerable to Almighty God than H-E-L-L hell. In the Bible, it, it sure will tell us about a God who hates hell, but he hates sin more than he hates hell. The Bible, let God be thrown into the trash can and got us a God with whom we can live like hogs and still be comfortable. That God will tell us that thistles and thorns and sweat are better than sin. That sorrow is better than sin. That suffering is better than sin. That pain and poverty and affliction are better than sin. Than wars and plagues and famines and disease and destruction. And deaths are better than sin. Oh, my soul, this is the language of the God of the Bible. The one thing that provokes his anger and his destruction. Is this I am saying? How terrible. Endless tyranny. Unpitied tears. Broken hearts are better than sin. Under God today, when we've been told on every hand that whatever rock burn it walks, he's got a right to. That any impulse of my mind or my spirit or my body must be satisfied. Oh, God, for a consciousness of what it means to live in sin. You know what it means? It means to die there. It means as the tree falls, so it lies. How terrible to die and face God. The God of whom the psalmist said, If thou shouldst mark iniquity, write it down. Who should be able to stand? And that's the only story in spite of the fact I don't think anybody believes it. Nobody can stand. If God marks down H.G. Wells, you know, the godless writer of the guy the name's Kleinfall, he, you know, H.G. Wells, that godless writer of our day, gone now, paints such a picture of what's going to happen. Utter despair. Said when he was a little boy, he came to H.A.T.E. hate the God they told him about. He said, my mother and father 
told me that God sees what's going on. He said, my mother and father told me that God takes note of what's going on. He said, my mother and father told me that God records what's going on. And he said, I came to H-A-T-E hate of God to watch me and keep a record on me. But under God, that's exactly what God does. And we desperately need to face that enough to where we join Mr. A.G. Wells and hate it or fear it. How awful to die. Guilty of sin, unforgiven, and face a God who keeps books. But I must call your attention to the fact, chances are, you will die in your sins. Because you got a nature, the Bible says, you hate righteousness, and you lap iniquity like water. It's kind of folks you are. You've got a heart that's a cesspool of hostility to God's holy law. You've got a nature, and you can improve it and dress it up, but you can't change it, that actually hates any kind of authority. You've got a will that's a cripple and perverted. I wouldn't brag on what you're going to do too much. You living in a generation whose God is its belly, and even now we churches and preachers are being pressured on every hand to turn the meeting of the saints into an entertainment. I think there's just one thing worth living for now, and that's to gratify the desires of my body. You know anything else worth living for? You know anything else worth eight, working eight hours a day for, watching the time clock, hurry home, so you can pamper the flesh? Oh, pleasure. That which I want, I got a right to. That which I want, God Almighty, just get out of the way, I'm going to have it. That spirit that has turned God's holy day into a Roman holiday. That spirit, I reading this morning, where seventy seven percent of the church-related college students in America say that sex relationships are desirable before marriage and the right of boys and girls. That spirit that enables a college professor to see that in another few years our society will be almost a hundred percent utterly unmoral. You living in that day when nothing under God's shining sun is going to be allowed to get in the way of Ralph Barnard, God hating, God hating, Ralph Barnard with a corrupt, foul, evil, filthy nature. It makes me just lap iniquity. That's rebellion like a dog, thirsty lap. Water! Rod Barnard that the Old Testament calls a wriggling maggot. It's the cesspool of words. Rod Barnard! Going to have his way! Whatever I want, I'm going to get! And if your religion gets in my way, ouch.
you go. You're living in a generation more and more finding ways to beat Almighty God. I remember when girls were afraid to lose their virtue. Not now. Birth control. Contraceptive. Huh? I remember reading in a book, seemed me like it's the Bible. What? So ever you sow, that shall you reap. That's one verse of Scripture. Anybody that God got this sense on earth knows ain't so. We just found ways to beat God, brother. We found ways to raise hell and not have to pay the bill. Yeah, the old crazy brother Barnum going up down this land said, Oh, hell's going to burst on this generation. That is absolutely discarded the law of God and the God of the law. We don't need him. That old book is a bunch of fairy tales. You need to tell me the wages of sin is death. I'm getting by all right. And I will forget when the biggest drunk in the city, my last pastor many, many years ago, they caught me out of town and they had a business meeting and the doctor put a shot in his arm. The old drunk, he's chairman of the board of deacons, and they sobered him up in an hour's time so he could stand up and pass a motion to fire the preacher. You mean tell me that booze will kill you? Well, they got a high pole sober you up in 30 minutes. My old army colonel, in the first camp I was in as an army chaplain, he'd get as drunk as a boy now every sun Saturday night. And he'd sit on the front seat every Sunday morning in chapel, just sober as an owl. The doctor'd give him some medicine to sober him up. And immorality? Well, there ain't no such animal now. It's just whatever I want, I'm going to get. There is nothing that Ross Barnard wrongs that's wrong. That's right. This is the atmosphere. Now, this is the kind of day you're living in, in which a gospel has been invented and is preached in most of our churches that will allow you to be a Christian never forsake sin. I expect you go join a church that allows anything under this Wonderful turn that we're not under law, we're under grace. And after all, we can't be perfect. And so let's go to church on Sunday and raise hell the rest of the time, and we'll go to heaven when we die. That's Christianity today. My Lord said, you know, there's just one escape. If you believe that I am He. I suspect there's more dynamite crowded in that word there in the context. If you believe that I am He. That's the only way of escape. If you could get to where you could actually believe that I am the sent one of God. Hold in the chain, wrote, in almost the last year of his holy ministry, said Mr. McChain, the man who made such a contribution to the cause of Christ in Scotland, Mr. McChain said, I had this evening a more complete understanding of that self-emptying and self-abasement with which it is necessary to come to Christ. A denying of self, trampling it underfoot, 
a recognition of the complete righteousness and justice of God that could do nothing else but condemn us utterly and thrust us down to the lowest hill. A feeling that even in hell we should rejoice in his sovereignty and say all was rightly done. Here's a man, Brother Pastor, the holiest man maybe Scotland ever knew, almost a saint of God. His conception of the character of Almighty God was so high. His experience with himself so deep. He never got to that nice little something that we've called Christianity. He never got to the place. He wasn't constantly trying to find something he could lay hold of. That would give him a little assurance in his own language that such a worm as he could bear to claim an interest in the merits and benefits of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Looks to me like here's a man that's trying to come to terms on the most tremendous proposition anybody will ever be faced with. Come to believe that Jesus Christ is the only way of escape. Not a convenience, but an utter necessity. Not an option. on that awful tree. He did something for me <laughs> that had to be done or a T-double-L-L that I can't do for myself in some conception of the fact that this call for an agonizing all out Closing with the Christ of the gospel on his terms for time and for eternity. If you could just come to where you believed it, actually believed it, these folks never did. These folks died in their sin. These folks didn't hear the warning. Maybe it came too late for her. I don't know anything else except to say, Brother, you need Jesus Christ. I wish you'd try your dead little best to get in contact with him. I wish you'd make it the all-out effort of your life. Get in the only door, the only door. Get on the only fire escape. Get in the only lifeboat. I wish you'd press through the crowd until you touch it with hands like a beggar laying hold on him, never to let him go. I wish the Spirit of God, he's been absent from this generation so long, I wish the hope windows of heaven be open and he could take this truth, who Jesus is. Is he what he claimed to be? Is he a necessity or an option? 
has God put all of his eggs in that basket? Is it Jesus or hell? I wish he'd set us crawling on our knees, if that's what it takes, to get under the blood, brother. Find a shelter, find a hiding place underneath his wings. I wish these next few minutes would be a time of seeking the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask the congregation if you'll be so kind. If you will not, please, nobody leave, nobody make any disturbance. I'll not hold you long. Will you stand quietly to your feet?